Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing a film called Tetsuo the Iron Man. This film came out in 1989. It is directed by cult filmmaker Shinya Tsukamoto. Tsukamoto is a very uh, prolific and creative person who started making a lot of short films with uh, Super 8 cameras when he was a teenager. And uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man was really his first uh, venture where he got to graduate from Super 8 into fancy 16 millimeter. This was a very low budget film and it was primarily funded by the money that Tsukamoto was able to make uh, in his day job and from what I understand it was a, a difficult experience making this film for the entire crew to such a degree that Tsukamoto almost just gave up completely on the project. But I'm so so glad that he did not give up because whatever sort of stress, whatever tension, claustrophobia, uh, took place in the making of the film with the crew on set. It, it you know, it, it was channeled into this this film, which, you know, I don't know what kind of words you could use to describe this kind of film. This is the kind of movie that makes you feel like as you're watching it, your brain is going to expand to such a degree that it's just going to pop and just pieces of brain are going to fly all over the room. It's also one of those movies that makes you feel like um, even if you are completely sober, have not taken any hallucinogens whatsoever, you're going to feel like you're on them or like maybe your drink was spiked or, or something. It is the mindfuck of all mindfucks. I mean, for real, it is one of those movies where if you just want an extreme intense experience, uh, this is the one. And I think also if you're really into the cyberpunk aesthetic and particularly kind of low budget um, 1980s body horror with like Rick Baker type uh, makeup and special effects, this movie is is your wet dream. It's one of the most unrelenting films and it's one that you really, really do feel. Hence, it's the body horror genre. So, it, you know, it's very carnal. It'll melt your eyeballs. You know, blood vessels will be bursting from your neck. You'll be writhing in filth, ear piercing screams. And I, I love it. If you're along for the ride, if you're willing to have it, then you're gonna get your, your money's worth. And you know, it's, like I said, it's a cyberpunk low budget horror film. And I think it really capitalized on the trend of the cyberpunk aesthetic, which was kind of reaching its peak in the late 1980s. And thus it kind of became one of those cult classics that people just kind of pass around to each other underground, kind of like the, dude, you gotta watch this shit kind of mentality. This movie came out in 1989. Akira came out in 1988, also a, a, a huge classic in anime films. And both are just major staples of the cyberpunk genre for sure. And Akira, thematically deals with a lot of the, uh, the the same elements that we're dealing with here. It has a lot of those body horror elements as well, but this movie kind of handles it in, in a very different way. It's more, I equate it more to like the late 70s um, midnight movie. It certainly carries a lot of those influences, I think. You know, I see a lot of David Lynch here. I see a lot of um, Eraserhead in particular. Uh, Tsukamoto has been very open about his love for, for people like David Lynch, but the, the major comp comparison to draw here would be you know, David Cronenberg. Tsukamoto is almost like a descendant of Cronenberg in a lot of ways. There are heavy, heavy, heavy influences here, especially a movie like Videodrome, which is, you know, one of my favorite horror movies of all time, which was also released in the 1980s as a body horror film. They are very similar, though Tetsuo is more kind of balls to the wall, kind of the extremist version in, in a lot of ways. Literalized in a B-movie style where all of the themes of viewing technology through an existential lens kind of allows all of these weird gray areas to kind of slither into each other, sort of marinating in their juices in a very psychosexual sense. And yes, this review is going to have a lot of descriptive words there. But when you look at Videodrome and the core idea of it, this idea of, you know, technology being explored on a much um, deeper level, how the technology that we create a lot of the time is connected to, you know, our, our most deep feelings, our most intimate feelings, and how all of that is connected in a way to the, the unconscious. Technology has given us this ability to create virtual realities, and it's only growing and growing. And, you know, in a lot of ways, that is an extension of ourselves, you know, but it can be a romanticized version of ourselves, a more kind of like a cartoon version of ourselves. And yet in a lot of ways, it's still revealing a lot about who we are, perhaps in ways that maybe we don't intend, especially through online personas. It's this need for control and in, in terms of how you're perceived, but as well as, you know, having a sense of power and machinery and industry and all of that is very seductive in that way. And it can be turned into a sort of a erotic sort of symbolism. And I feel like these two films in particular, Videodrome and Tetsuo the Iron Man, explore that need for dominance in this particular fashion. 
in a way that is extremely unique and different. I don't think that the internet, especially social media and YouTube and all of that and comment sections is really that different from dreams. It is a chance for our subconscious to be able to vent and comment sections are very revealing typically and dreams are very revealing about our desires, much more revealing than how we present ourselves in our, our waking life and the technology we've created, I think simply exposes that in a, in a similar way. And while I think Videodrome is very kind of sophisticated in the way that it, it presents its thesis. Tetsuo by comparison is a lot more kind of raw and rough, much more rudimentary, much more kind of simplistic in certain ways, uh, more visceral, less cerebral, and yet I think it works so, so, so well. I feel like I gain so much from both of them, even though they're so different. It's just like two different sides of the same coin in a lot of ways. They, they work as companion pieces, I feel. The body horror is just really effective here, and I feel like it was, it was very effective at this time in this time period, in the 1980s, and less so uh, maybe now just overall. But body horror is just great. I love it. I love it when it's done well. I don't know why. It's always something that I've just been really fascinated by. And I think it's just because it connects us to our most kind of primal desires. And also that lack of control is, is very, very important. And I think body horror obviously is going to be very effective for certain people, especially the, the hypochondriacs out there. It's feeling like you can't control your body or your mind as if like, you know, a poison has invaded it, a cancer, a disease that's eating you alive. The effects in Tetsuo I think are absolutely phenomenal, especially for just, you know, the kind of movie that it is. I'm amazed by what they were able to come up with. It's very, very creative. It's so insanely intense and grotesque and above all, just very committed. It's the commitment to it and just being so um, unrelenting that I, I really do admire. Just the metal protruding as though it's like a, another ligament coming out of your body and just like the maggots crawling like inside the skin. How these machines are invading the body and they're contorting and they're expanding and they're shrinking. It's violent. It's nightmarish. It's claustrophobic. And yeah, the practicality of these particular effects, I just think have a, a personality to them. There, there's just more um, um, texture to it than you get from a lot of stuff that they do on on computers nowadays. And I think in order to really achieve, you know, this level of, of madness and intensity for a film, you know, it's very necessary to be willing to be very bold and go to the places that a lot of people would shy away from. And I think that this movie is, yeah, it, it's so ballsy. It's so uncompromising and that might be one of its great strengths. Even in the score, you know, it's just like the clangs of metal, it's just clanging, clanging, extremely percussive. It almost sounds like merciless, like you want it to end and yet it drives drives the feeling of the film, the mood of it so well. And I love the idea of a movie allowing you to explore, you know, just the extreme, most terrifying areas of the mind that you're not used to. And it's all coming together in a really kind of layered, interesting way, but it's all within an hour time frame, or at least close to that. This film is very, very short. It's a little over an hour. But my favorite thing about it, and I think this is the thing that really is what makes it a cult classic and the thing that people want to return to, is, you know, how it ties sexual sexuality into the technological dominance angle. How they often fuse together, and it, it seems like technology and sexuality is a big thing to Tsukamoto. One of my favorite sequences is, is the big kind of, you know, notorious sex scene in the movie, you know, because it it's such a strange and well done sequence because, you know, it's very surreal. And a lot of times you're really not sure what's real, what's not, what is a dream. It is like experiencing a bad acid trip. No joke. It's just, it's violating. It is brutal. It's erotic. It's all of these things that are really extreme. And it feels like it's just shooting through your body as if possessed. And that's what, you know, this main character feels like, seems to be experiencing. And, and when you're watching it, it's like you feel a lot of things as well. You're not sure whether or not you're supposed to be laughing or you're supposed to be very alarmed. The next minute you're disturbed, but I have to point out there is a lot of humor in this movie. I found myself laughing a lot of the time because it's just, <laughs> there's a lot of very funny phallic imagery and, and phallic jokes. So much phallic imagery and it's just ramming itself into that third eye. But above all, all of these feelings, these visceral feelings aren't just there for the sake of shock value. I think they really do mean something. You know, it all ties together with these tools that were given, you know, these machines, technology and all of that. And our relationship 
with those particular tools that we're given, the, the, the tools that we create, much like Videodrome, which also explores all of those ties between, you know, sex and technology. And even today, you know, when you think about sex and how it relates to technology, it gets more and more literal in a lot of ways, because especially when you think of all the different specialized porn that we have today that's available and, and you know, virtual sex, very conceptual, very ambitious ideas of what, what sex can be, but it's all provided through technology and entertainment. And where is the line between what is sadistic, masochistic, pleasure? How does this affect us as a society and how we view each other? And in the case of Tetsuo, what does it say about who we are and what we want? This movie is all about those things that we hold so tightly to the chest and are afraid to reveal. And really the only thing holding all that back is just this thin layer of membrane, you know, like just this, the skin, bones, and blood. And when all of that is awakened, what happens? So yes, even though this film is very simple in terms of how it's set up, in terms of the characters, in terms of the story and all of that, I don't know, something about the viscera of it feels extremely complex to me and, and seems to be really exploring the gray areas in a really visual way. It just kind of runs rampant and then from that you're able to create a sort of subverted kind of feeling that is very surprising. I love the graininess of the film. I love the grit of it, the immediacy, the expressionistic style is, is really cool. You can't help when you watch it but think about a lot of German expressionist silent horror films of the period in the early 1900s and the 1920s. I think a lot about Fritz Lang and even movies that he made like M, you know, which came out in what, I think like 1931 or something like that. And, you know, it, it came out when, when talking pictures were the thing and yet he kept dialogue to very minimal and this movie has very little dialogue, but it doesn't need it. This is really like a movie, as in this is about the experience of it, how those images and sounds affect you in a really unique way. I highly, highly recommend this movie if you are in for a really fucking crazy ride. A short ride, but one I think that you won't forget. And again, one that really expresses a lot. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. and. Hopefully you do as well. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. All of my Patreon supporters are here. Thank you guys as always. If you're into art and you like supporting artists, I am an artist as well. And I do commissioned uh, portraits and I sell prints on my website. It is deepfocuslens.com. I have a link for it below. If you're interested in a commission or you have any questions about that particular thing or prints, you can always email me. I have my email as well below. And beyond that, all of my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.